This is the fourth video in a larger series on full stack data science. In the previous video of the series, I discussed how we can make data pipelines for machine learning projects. Here I'll discuss the next stage in the ML pipeline, which is how we can use data to build AI solutions. I'll start with a high level overview and then dive into a hands-on example with Python code. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Shah. I make videos about data science and entrepreneurship. And if you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing. That's a great no cost way you can support me and all the videos that I make. Although we can draw parallels between traditional software development and machine learning development, there are several key differences that are important to keep in mind. The first and most fundamental is that in traditional software development, the rules and the logic that make up the program are explicitly written into the computer by the programmer. However, when it comes to machine learning, computers aren't told what to do explicitly, but rather the rules or the instructions of the program are learned from data directly. While this allows us to build ML solutions for things we could never write traditional software for, such as text generation or autonomous driving, this indirect way of programming computers gives rise to a few other key differences. For one, the behavior of traditional software systems are typically predictable. In other words, given any input for a traditional software system, you can typically know what the output is going to be. On the other hand, the behavior of machine learning systems is a bit more unpredictable. You don't always know how the system will react to particular edge cases. No matter how many tests you come up with to evaluate your system, there will always be examples that you can't take into consideration because there are an infinite number of them. Another key difference is that traditional software systems are usually interpretable, meaning you can usually have an intuitive understanding of how a software system took any given input and generated a specific output. On the other hand, machine learning systems are often uninterpretable, or at least they're not interpretable in the same way that traditional software systems are. So even though a machine learning system can often generate better performance than a traditional software system, that often and comes at the cost of interpretability. And then finally, traditional software development typically has a linear development cycle, or at least a clear development cycle. In other words, projects can progress in a predictable manner. On the other hand, developing machine learning systems is often iterative, and progress might be made in a non-linear type of way. While these differences create several downstream consequences in how we should think about machine learning development as opposed to traditional software development, the the main thing I want to focus on here is the role of experimentation. The way I see it, this is what makes data science closer to something a scientist might do rather than an engineer. More specifically, scientists typically have hypotheses that they'll test against experiments, while engineers are typically implementing a given design. Of course, it's not always this black and white in practice, but experimenting with multiple potential solutions is a key role of of a data scientist. So what this typically looks like is represented by this flow chart here. So what this is representing is that we have the real world, which is full of things that are happening, some things we care about, some things we don't care about. What we do when we want to build ML solutions is we collect data about some of the things that we care about in the real world, and then we make that data available so that we can develop a machine learning solution with it. Once we have a candidate solution, we can evaluate the efficacy or the value of that solution. Typically, this results in a set of feedback loops. So you might evaluate a solution, see that the performance isn't so great. So you go back and you tweak some parameters and you evaluate it again, and then you tweak some more parameters and you keep going in this feedback loop. And of course, this loop might even be automated. You may exhaustively search a bunch of different parameters and still not get the results that you want. So you decide to go back and change the data set that you're using for your solution development and perhaps repeat this whole process. Finally, you might realize that the data that you have available isn't sufficient to develop your solution. So you go back to the real world and you reevaluate the data that you need. This is why developing ML solutions is iterative and often non-linear because you might go through hundreds of iterations of your solution before finally realizing that you weren't collecting sufficient data. And then once you grab one key 
variable, for example, and pass it into your model, you find that you finally get the performance that you need and the value is generated. So to make this a bit more concrete, let's look at a specific example. Let's say we wanted to develop a semantic search system. This is something I've talked about in a couple previous videos of the series, including the one on RAG and the one on text embeddings. But if you're not familiar with semantic search, the basic idea is that we start with a set of documents and then we take these documents and we generate numerical representations of them, which we call text embeddings. Then what we can do is develop a search tool where a user can type in a query, we can generate a numerical representation of this query, and then we can evaluate which documents are closest to the user's query and return them as search results. And it's called semantic search because rather than using specific keywords in the user's query, the meaning of the query and the meaning of the documents are captured by these numerical representations. Since I have a video all about text embeddings, I won't go into the details here, but I'll link that video in case you wanna learn more. While this might seem like a pretty straightforward idea, take documents, generate text embeddings, and then do some kind of similarity score between the query and all the different documents, there are several design choices that come up when developing this system. For example, given documents, documents have a lot of text in them. So what text do we want to use? For example, if these are blog articles, do we just want to use the title? Do we just want to use the first paragraph of the blog? Do we want to use the entire blog? Another one is, should we chunk the text? If we're talking about a blog, it could include include a lot of different information where one paragraph is relevant to a potential user's query, but the rest of the document is irrelevant. This may result in our semantic search to be a crude approximation of the underlying information in the documents. Another question is, should we summarize the text? If you have a long document, maybe you want to summarize it just so you capture the key information before passing it into an embedding model. But of course, there's more. What embedding model do you want to choose? There are several several readily available models, both open source models and closed source models. Also, should we embed multiple parts of a document? So if you have an article again, do you want to embed the title and the body of the document separately and then maybe combine them in some way? And then talking about the search tool, like how do you want to measure the distance between a query and all the different documents? How should we filter results? You have millions of documents. It might be a good idea to narrow down the candidates before or applying the semantic search because it's a bit more computationally expensive. And then should we use meta tags? You wanna add tags to documents to help with this filtering process. So all that to say, there are countless design choices that come up when developing any machine learning solution. And even everything I discussed here is far from an exhaustive list. So to make this even more concrete, let's look at a real world example of building a semantic search system. Here, I'm gonna walk through a process project that I'm currently building to perform semantic search over all of my YouTube videos. And this project has been the focus of this larger series where in the previous video, we built the data pipeline for this project. We started with the data source, which was the YouTube API. We saw how we can build a data pipeline for this project. I extracted information about all my YouTube videos from the YouTube API. I did some light transformations and then I loaded them into a data store, specifically a parquet file. In this video, I'm going to walk through the experimentation piece of building this semantic search tool. So we're going to take that parquet file, which includes things like the video's ID, its title, and transcript. We're going to generate text embeddings, and then we'll build a search tool with a user interface. And here there are a few design choices that I will experiment with, specifically whether we should base the search on the video's title title, its transcripts, or both, picking an embedding model from three open source options, and then finally defining the metric or how we're going to define the similarity between the query and all the different videos. And there will be five options of that. Looking through this, if we have three options times three options times five options, these are 45 different options for this semantic search system. And of course, these aren't things that we're going to hard code one by one 
one, I'll show how we can automatically generate all of these solutions and objectively compare them to one another using an evaluation metric. With that high level overview of what we're gonna do, I'm gonna jump into the code, which is available on the GitHub linked here, and I'll also put it in the description and comment section below. So before jumping into the code, let's just see what the final product looks like. By the end of this, we'll have a user interface like this, where we can type in a query and then it'll spit out responses. The formatting doesn't look great because it's just a POC, but we can see if I type in something like LLM, it'll return a bunch of videos from my channel as well as links to them. So that's pretty cool. And then we can search something else. What are fat tails? And then we go, we get all my videos on fat tailedness. Let's see, how can I build a semantic search? System. All right, so this is the perfect video to return because I literally walk through it in this video. We'll come back to this and play around with it a bit more. But anyway, I'm gonna walk through three different notebooks, all available on the GitHub repository. The first one is gonna be the experimentation piece where we're gonna loop through all 45 different options and compare them all to each other using an evaluation metric. Once we figured out which of the 45 options is best, we'll create a video index based on that configuration and then finally, we'll write the search function and create the user interface. Starting from the top, first I import polars, which helps us handle the data structures. And polars, if you're unfamiliar, is basically like pandas, but it's much faster and is gaining popularity rapidly. This project was a good excuse for me to try out polars. And so far, I've enjoyed the experience. Then we import sentence transformers, which has a handful of open source text embedding models we can use. And then we import some distance metrics from sklearn. The distance metrics will allow us to evaluate how similar a user's query is to each video in the data set. We'll import NumPy to work with the matrices that we get from the search function. And then I import matplotlib, which I may or may not use, but this is a great thing to have whenever you're doing any sort of experimentation of machine learning models. So you can plot things like histograms and scatter plots to compare the performance of different solutions. Solutions. First, we load the data like any other machine learning project. The way I do it here is I have two data sets. One is a data set of the transcripts saved in video-transcripts.parquet. It's a data set containing all of my YouTube videos and YouTube shorts. So it has all my video IDs, the dates they were posted, the title of the content, and the transcript. This is just the head. We can also look at the shape. So I have 83 videos, very small data set by ML standards, but it took a long time to make those 83 videos. Next, we have this evaluation data set, which consists of two columns. One is example query, and the other is the ground truth video associated with that query. The point of this evaluation data set is to give us a way to objectively compare multiple potential solutions to one another. So whether you're training a model from scratch or you're using a model off the shelf like we're doing in this this example, you need to have an evaluation data set so you can effectively compare multiple candidate solutions together. We can also look at the shape of this data set. And so we see we have 64 examples. Next, I'm doing some data preparation. What I'm doing here is I'm gonna loop through each title and transcript in the original data frame. So each of these titles and each of these transcripts, and I'm gonna loop through three different embedding models available in the sentence transformers library. So two different columns with three different models gives us six possible configurations. In this chunk of code, I loop through every possible combination. So you'll have the title with these three models, and then you'll have the transcript with these three models. So six possible combinations. I'll loop through each one and generate the embedding. So what that looks like is a nested for loop. So I have a for loop for the model name and I have a for loop for the column names. I'm going to store everything in the dictionary, so I initialize that here. And now just walking through this code, first we define the embedding model that we wanna use. We set model equal to sentence transformers model name. And then once we have the model, we can generate an embedding for a particular column. Here I define a key, so we have a unique identifier for each element in the dictionary. And then in this line of code, I'll use the model to generate the text embeddings for every piece of text in that column. For 
example, if we're encoding the title, this will take the title column of the data frame, convert it to a list, and then pass it into this encode function and spit out a array of all the embeddings. Finally, we'll store the key name and embedding array in the dictionary. So the key name is just gonna be a unique ID. It'll be the model name with the column name, and then we'll have the embedding array for that combination. If we look at the embedding array, that's gonna be 83 by 768. So we have 83 videos, and then the text embedding has 768 dimensions. So that's where this number comes from. And of course, each embedding model will be different. Another thing we can look at is this text embedding dictionary view of that we'll see that we have the model name appended by the column that we're embedding. And then we'll have a NumPy array with all the numbers associated with each text embedding. So if we look at this one specifically, we see it's a NumPy array, and then we can look at its shape. And then we see this one is 83 by 384. Notice that different embedding models will have different embedding dimensions. So this one is actually smaller than the other one, which would have been this model. Yeah, so this model has 768 while the other one has 364 or whatever it was, I already forgot. Going back to this time function, this is really handy when it comes to doing these experiments because it'll automatically spit out the time it took to run this line of code here. This is helpful because it can allow us to get a rough idea of the computational cost of each of these configurations. So we can see that generating embeddings for the transcripts tends to take longer than for just the titles with this case being an exception, maybe there's some kind of startup cost with running the first one. And then these models tend to have different costs associated with them. And the reason is that they actually get bigger and bigger. Another thing I'll share is that if we go to the sentence transformers documentation, they have a handful of pre-trained models here. Let's see, all mini LM6. Yeah, okay. So this is one that we're using. It's actually the smallest one. And we can see that it's 80 megabytes. While the largest one that we're using, multi-QA MPNet, the largest one we're using is more than five times as large at 420 megabytes. So these are all important things to take into consideration, not just the performance of the solution, Solution, but the computational cost associated with it because that plays a role as well. And then another thing going back, this code might be difficult to read or seem a little complicated because we have these nested for loops and we don't really know the model names and column names that are stored in this list here. Some may have the inclination to want to hard code all of these things. For example, just taking this line of code of defining the model name and then this line of code of generating the embedding array and then copy pasting something like this. We'll take the model name, embedding array, doing this and then tweaking it and then repeating that for this and then so on and so forth. While in a sense, this might be simpler, when it comes to doing experimentation across multiple potential solutions, this is an absolute nightmare. Because say you take this to your team or you read an article talking about how great this other model is, if you wanted to go back and change your code, it's a lot to keep track of. Because now you gotta change it here and then maybe two cells down, you use the model name again and then you gotta think about keeping track of this and then if you're copy pasting inputs like this, you're bound to make a typo and then it's gonna cause issues down the line. That is the number one reason why I could not recommend enough to write your code something like this, where you have somewhere where you basically define all the different options that you're trying to play with and then just let the code run its magic below and print out all the results that you need to see. Manually going in and tweaking code blocks here is gonna inevitably lead to errors. And this is just something I learned the hard way in grad school where I would train a model, present it to the research group, and they're like, oh, that's amazing. But what if you tweaked this? And what if you tried this? And then I'm like, oh, okay. So I'd go back, but then my code wasn't written like this. A lot of manual tweaking. And then I would mess things up and things would stop running. Then I'd finally get it working and take it back to the group. And then they would come up with some other suggestions. And so writing it this way allows you to iterate much faster and helps you avoid a lot of headaches. That was a bit of a, 
lecture there, but it's super important. Next block of code, basically doing the same thing, but instead of embedding the titles and the transcripts for each YouTube video, doing it for each of the queries in the evaluation data set. This code is a bit simpler since we don't have to iterate through the column names, but it's exactly the same. Then we move on to evaluating the different search methods. Here I define a handful of functions, which we can just skip for now and I'll return back to them as we come across them in the code. But here I'm doing a similar thing as before. I'm listing all the different ways we can evaluate the similarity between the query and a particular video. Here I list three different distance metrics from scikit-learn, then two different similarity metrics from the sentence transformers library. We're going to evaluate all possible combinations of model, columns to embed, and distance metrics or similarity scores. So again, this is 45 different combinations. Even if you could have hard coded the last six combinations, do not hard code 45 different configurations. Just write the for loop. Similar situation here, we're gonna loop through the models. Here I'm grabbing the text embeddings for all 64 queries in the evaluation data set. So I stored them all in this query embedding dict. If we look at this thing, we see it's a NumPy array, and then we'll have a row for each query, and then we'll have a column for each embedding dimension. Then we're gonna loop through all the text columns and we're gonna pull the text embeddings for that particular column. First, we'll start with the title. This is gonna pull the text embeddings of the titles for every one of the videos. Looking at that, this will also be a NumPy array, but we see that the number of rows is 83 because I have 83 videos. And then finally, we have a third for loop because we're gonna loop through each of the distance metrics. This will get us this dist object, which we can use to compute pairwise distances for all the videos and all the queries. So this final thing will be an array of distances. We can look at the shape. Notice that there are 83 rows corresponding to 83 videos and 64 columns corresponding to 64 queries in the evaluation data set. Each element of this array will be the distance between the ith video and the jth query. For example, if we looked at the very first element, this would be the distance between the first query in our evaluation data set and the first video in our video index. We're going to use this arg sort function from NumPy to sort each of the columns. And so if we go back to the dist array, we have 83 rows and 64 columns. So if we sort each column, we're gonna rank the videos from smallest distance to largest distance for each of the 64 queries. Since it's arg sort, instead of returning the ordered values themselves, it's gonna return the index of the values in ascending order. Next, I define a method name, and this is essentially like we did before, where we had a unique name for each combination of model and column, but here, we're going to combine the model name, the column name, and the distance name. So each of the 45 configurations for this search tool has a unique name. So here I use a function that I defined called evaluate true rankings, which evaluates the ranking of the ground truth. In other words, for a given query, we have 83 possible videos to return, but only one ground truth in the evaluation data set. What this function does is that it returns the ranking of the ground truth for each each of the 64 queries. That function is defined here. And I won't walk through this because I feel like that might get too far into the weeds, but if you're curious, the code is available on GitHub. But we can look at the shape of this thing. We can see that it's essentially a one-dimensional array with a ranking value for each of the 64 queries. We can see for the first query, the ground truth was in the third position. For the second query, the ground truth was in the zeroth position, so it was the the number one ranking and so on and so forth. And so what I do here is I convert this whole thing to a list and then I append it to the method name. So basically a val list is just gonna be one giant list of all the rankings with the first element being the method name. And then I store that in another list called eval results. So this eval results will be a list of lists where each 
each element is a list corresponding to a particular configuration. So we can't use shape because it's a list. But we'll look at the length and we see, yes, there are 45 elements. 45 elements for the 45 possible combinations. This is where a little hard coding comes in because the distance metrics are from scikit-learn while the similarity scores I'm importing from the sentence transformers library. So since the syntax is a bit different, I have to write a different script for that. Of course, this part is copy pasted essentially. So I could have have been a bit more clever in how I wrote this code. But in this specific case, I thought it was easier to just leave it how it is like this. The one thing I did here, which people might come after me for, is I dynamically defined this line of code using this syntax, and then I executed that command using the exec function. Command is just a string, which looks like a piece of Python code. So we're defining this distance array as the minus of the similarity score between the embedding array and query embedding. And the reason I put minus is that since this is a similarity score, it's the inverse of a distance score. So in other words, if two things are close together, a distance score will be small, but a similarity score will be large. So instead of changing this arg sort to go the other direction, I just add this minus sign. So it reverses the order and then the code will be exactly the same. We'll sort the indexes like before. We'll define a method name. We'll extract the ranking of the ground truth for each of the queries and then we'll store it in the eval list and then store that list in the eval results list. And then here I basically do the same exact thing but it's a little different because I'm embedding the titles and the transcripts while before I was embedding either the title or the transcripts. Here I embed both and then it's a lot of the same stuff but here's the key difference. When I do the pairwise distance, I compute the distance between the title embedding and the query embedding, as well as the transcript embedding and the query embedding. And then I add those two distance arrays to each other and then repeat the same process. So we've seen this chunk of code for a third time now. So that's a good indication. I should have wrote a function to do this, but here we are. Then I do a similar thing for the similarity scores. And so this is the downside of automatically generating code and running it is it's kind of hard to read this line here. So we can just run it and take a clear look at it. Here we define the distance array as the minus of the similarity score between the title embedding and the query embedding minus the similarity score between the transcript embedding and the query embedding. Again, we have to do that because this similarity score will either be the cosine similarity or the dot score. And then we have to add the minus sign to turn the similarity metric into a distance metric. And again, magnitudes don't matter. It's just the rank that matters, which we get from this block of code here, which we've now seen a fourth time. So this definitely should have been a function. And then just some fanciness happening here. So maybe this is why I didn't do it as a function because title transcript changes as well. And then we have to adjust the similarity name to make the method name come out good. I changed the underscore and dot score and cosine similarity to a hyphen to make this a little easier to read. After that arduous process, we've generated 45 different configurations of of this search tool. And so everything is stored in this list called eval results, which should have 45 elements, which it does. But all this information in a list is kind of hard to access. So let's store it in a data frame to make it easier to make sense of. So to do that, I define a schema for the data frame. I do this programmatically where our data frame is going to end up having 65 columns, where the first column will correspond to the method name, which we generated programmatically. And the rest of the columns columns will correspond to the rank of that particular query for that particular method. So now you can imagine we're going to have 45 rows in this data frame for each configuration. And then we'll have a column corresponding to each query. And then the element of the data frame will be the ranking of the ground truth search result for that query using that method. So to make that a bit more concrete, it looks something like this. We have the method names in this column here. We have the ranking of the ground 
ground truth for every single query in the evaluation data set as columns. So with this first method here, let's just print the name so we can see what it is. For this first method, it's using the model all mini LM L6 V2. It's embedding the title and it uses the Euclidean distance between the query and the title embedding to rank the search results. And then using that method, the ground truth was the zeroth search result. So that indicates perfect performance using this metric. Then we repeat that for every single query and every single search method. Next, I'm going to create two summary statistics. So specifically the mean rank of the ground truth for a particular method. And then if the ground truth result appears in the top three results or is the number one result. So this gives us three summary statistics, which I add to the results data frame with these two lines of code. And then I'll create a new data frame called DF summary that just includes the summary statistics and doesn't have the more granular performance metrics shown here. We can look at this summary data frame from three different perspectives. First, we can rank it by the mean ranking of the ground truth. Truth. And so this first method had the best performance along this evaluation strategy, where the ground truth was usually either the zeroth or the first search result. So this method was using all mini LM L6 V2, which was our smallest model. It was using both the titles text embeddings and the transcripts text embeddings, and it used the Manhattan distance metric. And so a Manhattan distance, instead of Euclidean distance, which is like the direct direct path between two points on a graph. The Manhattan distance travels along a particular axis. So distances are computed along grids. So the shortest path along a particular grid. One thing that is kind of expected is that title and transcript combined together has the best performance. And we can actually see that a lot of these results have both the title and the transcript as text embeddings. But what's somewhat surprising is that the smallest model had the best performance performance as opposed to a bigger embedding model. Two other views is instead of ranking by the mean ground truth ranking, we can rank it by the number of top one search results. We can see that actually four methods had the ground truth in the number one result. And so this was again using this smallest model, but these didn't include the transcript. They just included the title, which is interesting. And then they all use different distance measures. So this one used Euclidean distance. This one is the cosine symbol. Similarity. This one is the dot score. Essentially, all three of these methods are equivalent, which is very interesting. Finally, we can look at this summary table according to the number of times the ground truth appeared in the top three. So again, we get three methods that had similar performance, but these were all different than what we saw before. So now what seems to perform best is our second largest model, which is multi-QA distilber host V1, where they all embedded both the title and the transcript, but then used different similarity scores. So notice that there was no one method that dominated all others. For instance, this first method outperformed this fifth method in terms of the number in the top three, but this method did better than this method in terms of number in top one. Similarly, even though this method outperformed this method down here in terms of number of top one, this method down here outperformed the method up top in terms terms of the average ranking of the ground truth. So this is kind of where the art comes in and you often synthesize this information in your own head to pick out the best strategy. And of course, you can make this more objective where you give particular weights to each of these evaluation scores. So maybe the average ranking of the ground truth is the most important evaluation metric you want to use. You'll give this ranking more weight as opposed to this ranking. Another thing you you might do is give more weight to a smaller model as opposed to a bigger model like this one multi QA MP net based dot V1 due to the computational cost and the storage costs of a larger model. So in this specific situation, I went with this model here for two main reasons. One, I feel the average ranking of the ground truth is a good evaluation metric to base things on. And it did pretty well in terms of this number in top 
three evaluation metric where it was basically in second place. And a lot of times you don't need the number one search result to be on the money. As long as the first few have what the user is looking for, that's typically a good user experience. At least that's just a hypothesis to be tested. And so through this whole experimentation process came to the conclusion that this is the best method to use. We'll move over to the next notebook where we're going to create the video index. And so this is pretty simple. So we read in our data frames. It's the same data frame we saw before. All we're going to do now is embed the titles and the transcripts so we can implement this specific method. That's pretty similar to what we saw in the previous notebook where we're going to loop through both the title and the transcript columns. We're going to generate embeddings. We're going to store these embeddings in a temporary data frame. It's going to have 83 rows for the 83 columns. And then we're going to have 384 columns for each of the embedding dimensions. And then what I do is I concatenate the original data frame that we imported here with this temporary embedding data frame. So that happens for both the title and the transcript. And the end result of that is that our original data frame went from 83 rows and four columns to 83 rows and 772 columns. If we print the head, it looks something like this, where we have a bunch of new columns corresponding to the title embedding and the transcript embedding. Then we simply can save this to file. So I'll save this as a parquet file called video index. So this is the final data store or database we can use in a production system. And it's hilariously small. The final file is like less than one megabyte. No need for any kind of fancy database or data warehouse to store this information. This is small enough. It can just be stored in the project file for the final system. Okay. And now moving on to the last notebook, we're going to implement the search function and generate a user interface for it. So here importing a lot of the same stuff as before. Now, instead of doing the read parquet, I'm doing scan parquet. So what this does is instead of loading this data frame into memory or into the Python environment, it's going to create a lazy frame object, which is what they call it in Polar that allows us to manipulate the data frame, so to speak, without loading it into memory. And then when we want to load it into memory, we can call a specific method called collect to do that. So this isn't totally necessary here because the data set is super small, but this is very handy when the size of your data set is larger than the amount of memory you have on your system. But it also just keeps things lightweight. You're not carrying around this bulky data frame throughout all your different operations. That's what's happening here. It's that video index we created in the previous notebook. We're defining the model name and then we're going to load it in and then we're going to import that distance metric. So in principle, all this stuff will be loaded ahead of time so that these are ready to go when the user goes to use the search function. Now I'm going to define the search function. So it's super simple. We'll write a function called return search results that takes in a user query and spits out the indexes of the search results in our data frame. What that looks like is if we type in the query LLM, it'll spit back out the indexes and then we can display the results using this line of code here. We'll have the video ID and then the title of the first result is LLMs explained in 60 seconds. Then we have how to build an LLM from scratch, how to prove LLMs with RAG, practical introduction to large language models, and video on fine tuning. So this return search results kind of does everything we need. Looking under the hood, this is similar to what we saw in the experimentation code code where we're generating an embedding for the query. But here we don't have to worry about the 64 queries in the evaluation data set. We just have one query coming from a user. Then we can compute the pairwise distance between the title embeddings, which are stored in these columns and the query embedding and the pairwise distances between the transcript embeddings and the query embedding. Then we'll add those together. Then I define a couple of search parameters. Specifically, I'm going to define a distance threshold. So I will only return results that have a distance of 40 or less away from the query. And then of those results, I'll only return the top five. I implement that in these two lines of code here, where I first find all the arguments that are less than the threshold. And then of those distances below the threshold, I will sort them and return their arguments or their indexes. And then finally, I'll take these sorted indexes below the threshold and return the top five. That's what's returned here.
here that allows us to print results in this way. But of course, this isn't a very intuitive user interface. Users aren't using Jupyter Notebook or coding in Python. So it's helpful to develop a GUI or a graphical user interface to interact with this functionality. I do that using Gradio. So I defined a few functions, which I'll hide to keep things simple. But basically with Gradio, you can spin up these user interfaces in a very simple way. So this is what it looks like. And then if we type in the same thing, we see the same search results as before. It looks kind of wonky because I'm so zoomed in, but let's open it up in a new tab and search the same thing. Okay, so that looks a little better. So we can see the same results that we saw in the Jupyter Notebook. LLMs explained in 60 seconds how to build an LLM from scratch, how to improve LLMs with RAG, introduction to LLMs, and the fine tuning video. Essentially what's happening here is instead of displaying the results like this, displaying the results in a user interface, briefly going through the radio code. Radio is pretty intuitive where it just creates the interface in like this top down manner. You can create this demo as a series of so-called blocks in radio, and then each line will be a block here. The first block is the title, which is a markdown object. So that's what this thing is here. Then below this markdown title, we'll have a row, which will consist of a text box, which will take in the user's query. And we'll have a button where when the user clicks the button, it'll run this search results function, which I defined here and we'll talk about in a second. But going back to the interface, we can see we have the text box where the user can type in their query and then a clickable search button. Looking under the hood to this search results function, it's calling a pseudo search API. So in production, this would be living in the cloud or some server you have available. But basically the API, the pseudo API will take a query and will spit back a result. And the pseudo API looks like this. Essentially what it's doing is it's running that same function we saw before this return search results. And instead of returning the results as a data frame, it's going to return it as a dictionary. We have a dictionary with two key value pairs. The first key is title with a list of titles from the top five search results. And the second key are the video IDs for those top five search results. And the reason I put it in a dictionary form is that when you're making these API calls, the responses typically come in a JSON format, which are essentially Python dictionaries. So I did that to mimic a API call. Once we have the response, we'll basically write code to format the response in the user interface. So I guess I'll take a step back and go back to the user interface. So again, this was the row we saw with the text box and the search button. But then what I do is I will generate five more rows corresponding to five top search results. What that looks like is we have this output Put list and I'll append an HTML object and a markdown object to it. What that corresponds to is that this is our HTML object and then this is our markdown object. And each of these items, this HTML block, this markdown block, this HTML block, this markdown block, these are all organized in this output list. So when we refresh the page, these are all empty, like they've just been initialized. So that's what's happening in this first pass. But whenever the user types something into the text box and hit search or they type something into the text box and just hit enter. That's what this line of code is corresponding to. It'll run this search results function. It'll update this output list. And so the first thing that it'll do is look at the number of responses that it receives because if there are less than five search results, it needs to be able to handle that case. And so let's say there are three search results. What's going to happen is it's going to loop through those three search results generating the HTML block and the markdown block for them and appending those to the output list. But then for the two remaining slots, it's going to make invisible HTML and markdown blocks for those results. An example of that might be if we just type in a bunch of mess. Okay, well, that was really crazy. So let's try something like Okay, so when I type in I lost my dog, not really relevant to anything on my YouTube channel, but there are still search results. You notice that there aren't five. It only returned two results and the remaining three are invisible. And then in that other case where we just have a bunch of craziness and nothing matches the search criteria, it'll just say no results, try rephrasing your query. And then that's handled as a special case in this if statement here.
So here we really got into the weeds of experimentation and what it looks like to develop a machine learning solution. While this does build out a lot of the core functionalities of the machine learning project, what we did here is not something suitable for a production system or something that you'll be able to use in the real world. Which brings me to the next video in this series where I'll talk about what I call phase three of any machine learning project. This is where we deploy our ML solution into to the real world. So in the next video, I'm gonna walk through three main things. First, developing a real API, not just a pseudo API that can access this search function. Second, containerizing the search function and its API to make that functionality much more portable. And then finally, deploying that container of code onto AWS. So that brings us to the end. If you enjoyed this video and you wanna learn more, be sure to check out other videos in this series on full stack data science. And as always, thank you so much for your time and thanks for watching.